Beyond the edges of Earth's atmosphere, there is an advanced network of space technology serving as an orbital watchtower to protect our nation and ensure the safety of our daily lives. But as the threat to our global security grows, so must our vigilance and urgency. At Redwire, we are honored to support those charged with defending our nation and its freedom to operate in space. Together, we are rapidly deploying solutions for warfighter communications that speed the exchange of information and shorten decision-making chains. We are building resilient mission architectures to mitigate threats and ensure dominance throughout space. And with our capabilities for space domain awareness, we help ensure the safety, security, and sustainability of our nation's activities in an increasingly contested environment. In the face of the unknown, we stand ready to serve the brave men and women who act as our guardians and using cutting edge technology are protecting our future. Together, we defend above. Okay, hello everyone. Hope this is on, oh, there we go. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Redwire's happy hour on this Tuesday at Space Symposium. My name is Camille Bergen. I am a science communicator and space content creator. You might have seen my videos, The Galactic Gal. Um, I am honored to be your host this week uh, for all Redwire talks at the booth. So we have tech talks and uh, mission spotlight. So this is a tech talk during happy hour. So please, the beer is over here. I don't see enough beers in your hand. So um, if you want to step away, please do. Um, but we are going to be talking about, and I lost the title of the panel, Enhancing the Resiliency of Our Space Assets. Is that right? Oh my gosh, <laughs> thankfully my <laughs> brain worked. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to our moderator, Steve Jakes, who is the Executive Director and Founder of the National Security Space Administ Association. Excuse me. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Working out? Okay, good. Good afternoon, everybody. A little closer? Ah. Got to get it in just the right place, right? Well, all of the centers around uh, dynamic space operations. I'm sure you all have heard those terms about a thousand times. We'll touch upon a little bit, and a little bit of a, a little bit of a sales campaign inside of the NSSA website. Uh, Chris Williams put together uh, with John Shaw's help a uh, about a 20-page uh, focused paper on dynamic space operations, and largely this conversation is going to center around that. Uh, some of the summaries out of that. I just, just, just to set the stage, some of the key words, uh, everybody knows that DSO is uh, gaining increased attention and emphasis across the National Security Space Enterprise. Uh, although maneuver has been a key facet of warfare, DSO concept is relatively immature today, um, and still there's, there's room for it to improve. Um, and, and today those, those national security operations are somewhat limited. Uh, while highly promise, promising, the extent to which DSO will contribute to U.S. space superiority remains to be seen. So as Chief of Staff uh, Chance uh, Saltman uh, recently said, we know speed to orbit, we know resilience on orbit, our fundamental principles to what we want to adhere to. Now, how do we take advantage of that if we, if, where, where we have it? That's where the work is left to be done. In the meantime, we all know what the Russians are doing. We all know what the Chinese are doing. They're moving the ball fast. Uh, they've been doing this almost quicker than we have. So it's our turn to be moving forward. So with that in mind, uh, it's my pleasure to go to my next piece of paper. To say that today's panel will discuss the strategies for safeguarding and fortifying our invaluable space assets, including cybersecurity, AI and ML, power systems, redundancy, proliferation, remote sensing, spatial situational awareness. Uh, we'll be talking about all those things uh, one by one. So we're going to do this by first allowing each of the panelists uh, to introduce themselves, tell you who they are, what they're about. Uh, we'll go through a few uh, of our uh, standard uh, questions. And we definitely want to open the, uh, the floor up to questions to you, for you folk, from you folks as well. So from this point, uh, we'll, we'll turn it over uh, to... Uh, the next person here in line, introduce yourself and let them know who you are. 
Hey everybody, my name is Ian Cinnamon. I am the uh, CEO and founder of a company called Apex. Apex is a satellite bus manufacturing company. So we build the platform. We build uh, ESPA, ESPA Grande, and larger platforms. And really the core focus of our company, and what we've tried to do from the very beginning, is really solve what we see as the largest bottleneck in the space industry, which comes down to the satellite bus and the platforms. Now that launch is happening on a near daily basis, what are the spacecraft that we're actually putting up into orbit? We want to be the bus provider, the platform provider that's able to do that. We work on a very much a production line, a lot of automotive engineering principles, and looking forward to discussing how that ties into resiliency and what that means uh, for the future of space. Thank I'm you, Ian. Uh, Evan? Thanks. My name is Evan Rogers. Sometimes you'll hear me referred to by my Air Force call sign, which is Jolly. Um, I spent nine years in the space operations community in the Air Force. I was an Air Force weapons officer. And I started Chernomaly in 2022 with three other former military co-founders because we recognized that there was a major gap in the defense industrial base's capacity to respond to emerging and rapidly evolving threats and the complexity that those threats were posing to national security space. Um, we started the company in 2022, very early in 2022. We just hit our Series B. Uh, two spacecraft in orbit, and we're really building a suite of capabilities that we wish we had when we were in uniform. A battle management capability called Mosaic, which is designed for autonomous command and control and automated force packaging for space superiority missions. And a spacecraft we call the Jackal Autonomous Orbital Vehicle, which is a rendezvous and prox ops ESPA class spacecraft designed for dynamic space operations, and we'll get into that uh, in more detail. Thanks for the time. I think we're going to break into song because this reminds me of being in a boy band. <laughs> yeah. uh, which one would we be? We yeah. have to figure out that would be. Dean, uh, go ahead, buddy. Thank you, Steve. Uh, for everybody out there, if you can hear me, Dean Bellamy, Executive Vice President, National Security Space at Redwire. Uh, uh, pleasure to have a chance to really uh, work and lead a lot of the growth on the national security side, supporting our DOD and IC customers. Many of you in the audience today, uh, retired Air Force Colonel. Had a chance to serve with Evan. Uh, we were in uniform together. Also, Andy, uh, when we were in uniform, and Steve as well, because uh, Steve also wore the uniform as well. Uh, and I would say, when I look across the audience, how about that hype video, Defend Above, huh? Uh, good on Mark Com, uh, and our team, Austin and Omar and Terry. Just want to give a shout out to them, and, uh, and really a toast to them, and a toast to my, our Mark Com team. And really, our partners like Andy, we would not be here if it wasn't. We've uh, been, uh, Red Wire's been uh, really fortunate enough to partner and roll out uh, several technologies with partners like AFRL. And just want to say, Andy, it's a pleasure to have you here again and to sort of be on the stage with so many great leaders and really uh, in our industry today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andy. Andy Williams. I am the Deputy Technology Executive Officer for Space at AFRL uh, at the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, so that role was a role that we created with the stand-up of the Space Force to really show and emphasize how important space was uh, to the research community and to the labs. It's put a, part of our one lab, uh, one fight mantra that we've get, been going after. And it's, it's really has genesis from two parts. One is that we have the space technologies in pretty much every single technical directorate that we have across AFRL, all 10 technical directorates that span the country, literally span the country from Rome, New York to Maui, Hawaii. And it's really focused at the fact that we know that for the complexity of the future fight, we are going to have to bring multi-domain solutions. It's going to be air solving space problems, space solving air problems, and really going after multi-domain problems to create the complexity that we need to defer conflict. And if unfortunately conflict evolves, to make sure that we win. And so that's really the focus. And my job is to make sure that we integrate and execute the space portfolio across all of AFRL. A great segue, Andy. Thank you very much. So let's go through a few questions. Are you hearing me OK? All right, just making sure. Uh, technical question number one, and we'll start with you, Ian. Uh, how does your organization help to enhance the resiliency of our nation's space assets? It's a great question. When we think about resiliency, we think about resiliency through a proliferated fleet of satellites. 
if you're going out and you're putting up one very large, expensive satellite, that is very brittle, right? If there could be cyber attacks, there could be ASATs, there's a lot of things that could go wrong with that. Our philosophy as a company and what we've seen uh, a lot of positive response with on the government side, both uh, US government and allied nations, is the idea of a higher volume of lower cost spacecraft that together can deliver the same capabilities, if not more, than a very expensive single satellite tends to be how we and others think about resiliency. So for us at Apex, our entire philosophy is how can we build and deliver satellite platforms to customers as quickly as possible, such that the satellite bus is never the long pole of the tent. Thank you, thank you. Kevin, to you, sir. We think of resiliency as one facet of an integrated deterrence strategy. And so True Anomaly's product roadmap is really aligned to the, the end state of integrated deterrence and combat power manifestation in the domain to solve multi-domain problems, as you said, right? It's, we, we, we need to be able to solve terrestrial problems, terrestrial defined more bro defined broadly, and we need terrestrial sources to define and, and solve space deterrence issues. Um, when we thought about building a product roadmap, we really took a step back and said, what, what does the hardware and software full stack working together look like for space resiliency and deterrence? And we came out with the foundation of everything we build, which is Mosaic. We, we think hardware is obviously an important element of effectuating effects, activities, maneuver without regret in the domain because that ultimately is what is gonna pull out the performance at the constellation level, right? And so we, we approach the design through the lens of first principles of military conflict and joint operations and the physics of the domain. Jackal is just really the way that the software interacts with the world, right? So in order for the software to interact effectively, you need to drive down the per unit cost, as Ian said, you, but the byproduct of driving down the per unit cost is Di resiliency vis-a-vis -vis disaggregation. It's not the only way to get there. Self-defense is also required. Um, dynamic capabilities on board the spacecraft, maneuverability, those kinds of things are also part of how we think about not just Jackal, but future product lines as well. And those two operating together really form the backbone of, of resiliency, we think. Thank you, Evan. Dean, to you, sir. Yeah, first, uh, you know, want to talk about the folks on the stage because resiliency starts with the great companies, right? The innovative companies like Apex. And look at what True Anomaly is doing as well. The innovation there that they're doing, right? We're uh, looking at the space domain awareness and the, the great products. The R&D and the work that's great work being done at AFRL. Without the work of the individuals, right? Uh, we wouldn't be able to really move fast as we are to outpace the adversary. And a lot of folks are really focused on that. At Redwire, when, whether you're looking at our space domain awareness uh, payloads, whether you're looking at our RF payloads that are providing war, critical warfighter communications, uh, you know, and we're ensuring that the data gets to the warfighter and the speed and need that it needs to be there so that it's actionable information and relevant. You know, those are really critical. And if you look at some of the, the work we're doing with some of our Link 16 antennas, that started with a partnership with AFRL, RV, and I just, you know, with the XVI program. And that's just one example of how people working together uh, to really build technologies uh, that are resilient technologies, but allow us to outpace our adversaries because they're continuing to operate and move fast. And you need uh, new commercial companies like the folks to my uh, right here, both Ian and Evan, doing what they're doing so we can outpace the adversary. Andy, so you are in a key position here. So from your perspective as a government customer and the innovation that comes out of AFRL, how do you see this? Yeah, so our, our focus is really on the science and technology that provides the maximum diversity of a portfolio so that we can make sure that we don't get tech surprise or, or that we can create tech surprise. That's one aspect of resiliency. So we have investments along the lines of everything that's been discussed so far. Uh, we're really focused at how do we accelerate the pivot to the hybrid architecture. That was a lot of uh, thinking that came out of AFRL as much as 10 years ago. How do we enable proliferated systems? How do we enable diversity in orbitology so that we take advantage of the advantage, so that we take advantages of unique capabilities in LEO, MEO, and GEO? And how do we also look at platform diversity? Not just large exquisite satellites, they do have some utility and, and some applicability, but also smaller satellites. 
If you look at any other warfighting domain, we don't just have one thing. The Navy doesn't just build submarines or aircraft carriers, right? They have a whole suite of capabilities. Same for the on the Air Force side. We don't just build B-21s or we don't just build low-cost UAVs. We have a mixture of forces that create inherent resiliency in the approach as well as capability. And the same is what we're going to have to do on the space side. We're going to need everything from small low-cost CubeSats or, or small platforms with, with significant capabilities all the way up to large satellites. And for those larger satellites, if we're going to go down that approach, we do need to be able to protect and defend. Whether that is inherent capabilities from a defense perspective like cyber or laser hardening from ground-based laser threats, or if there's other capabilities that we need. But we're really focused on what are the technologies that give senior leaders the most diverse options and trade space for decisions and decision making. And that's really how we're going to drive a resilient architecture. Absolutely, Andy. I, w I can't agree more. And, you know, when you look at the importance of our warfighters today and our, everyone's way of life here depends on space. So you got to protect those assets to ensure you can get that data and the warfighter data to the ground. hundred percent. Any other comments from you two guys? Okay, thanks, folks. Uh, next uh, simple topic, threats. Loaded, loaded one. We'll reverse it this time around. Uh, first to you, Andy. Uh, what are your assessments? There are always ever-changing threats coming our way. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, what do you consider to be the biggest threats that we're facing today in our environment? So... If you, haven't, if you haven't read the NASIC documents that really outlines the threat at the distro A level, go Google that and read it, right? It is very eye-opening of what is out there and what are the things that we need to worry about. And that covers the entire trade space from direct ascent threats to co-orbital threats to ground-based directed energy threats. And I won't outline or say that, that one of those is, is more of a threat than the other. I think they're all important and we need to mitigate against all of them. But there's two threats that I'm really most concerned about. One is the cyber threat, and how do we defend against the cyber threat? Because that's where we're going to be the weakest. It could be it could be a ground attack, it could be a space-based attack or a, a attack on the on the space systems. Right? Cyber is a real concern. The other concern that I have is any threats that we have to our supply chain, and the and the the concerns there, and making sure that we have a secure, robust supply chain that is able to adapt in the event of crisis and scale in the event of crisis. And so I think that's something that the U.S. and our allies need to, to work more closely with, understand what those ask, actual risks are to the supply chain, and how do we partner better to create supply chain resiliency with allied and partners. We don't necessarily need to build everything in the U.S., we have a lot of great allies. We have a lot of great partners. What can we leverage from their industrial basis so that we have a much more integrated global approach? And to me, those are the two key cyber are, are the two key threats: the cyber threat and the industrial based threat. Yeah, I hear you, Dean. Absolutely, I agree with Andy 100. percent And uh, when you look at secure supply chain, I think there's going to be uh, on satellites product lines like having resilient solar rays, having more space demand awareness, so you actually know what's operating around you. You know, it's uh, funny, uh, when I look at, um, when I grew up as a kid, we didn't have ring camera, right? So, I mean, how many of you in the audience have ring camera today at your house? All right, almost everybody, I mean, right? You don't. <laughs> right? So on your on ring, right, you get an alert on your phone, you know somebody's dropping off a package, you know somebody's driving up in your driveway, uh, we should have that type of situational awareness on satellites, but we don't, unfortunately, because the satellites we have were built for a ben benign environment, really. But war is now, uh, uh, space is now, as you can see, a warfighting domain. So having commercial companies like True Anomaly with their ability to go up and provide that situational awareness, that uh, space domain awareness of something's operating around you, what is it, and being able to perform because there's gaps in our knowledge uh, is critical. And when you look at secure supply chain, one thing that, you know, I'll, I'll give a shout out to Ian and Apex, right? Uh, a phenomenal job, if I remember right. Clean sheet, design, uh, real quick, and then you got to orbit. You, uh, phenomenal job What's there by you and your team, right? Great leadership by both these companies. And we need leadership from commercial companies like we have on the stage here for us to actually uh, start uh, really outpacing the threats we're seeing with adversaries. Thanks. Good, Evan. Yeah, I... I, I, anybody can go read the open source literature and we can talk about 
surface or space, missiles get launched from the surface of the Earth and strike satellites and, sat and satellites that attack other satellites and electronic warfare and cyber. And but I think at Chernobyl we like to think of this from a systems perspective. And the if the end state is a resilient architecture, is elastic cohesion, is the principles of warfare, and an architecture that actualizes those things, then what's the unlock? And it really is what General Saltzman has already articulated, which is responsible counter space campaigning. We have institutional inertia that is keeping from us from from executing concepts of operations and engaging the industrial base in a way that allows us to learn. So we're, we have this perfect is the enemy of good enough. We can get lost for a long time in thinking through the, the perfect architecture that would pose the most radical and extreme and effective deterrent against, against China and Russia. But that opens us up to the risk of a type two error, right? Which is we spend trillions of dollars on an architecture only to find out at the worst possible time that it's ineffective. Right, like we find out in other weapon systems when they take 10 to 20 years and a trillion dollars to go build um, without naming weapon system names, lest I get myself in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. So what we need is we, we, we just need to leverage the acquisition capabilities that exist. Program managers need to be educated on them. They need to feel the backstop of leadership to be able to go leverage those acquisition methods to move quickly. And we are gonna get a bunch of detritus we're going to get stuff that doesn't work, but, we, but over time, we're going to learn, right? The, the, the military is actually pretty good at learning. It takes a really, really long time, but actually pretty good at learning. And so the threat really is, it's us, right? Not us, the defense industrial base, us, the Pentagon. It is, it is the way that we think about procuring systems and the, the barriers to the speed of execution that allows us to learn the operational lessons that are required and what that means downstream for the technologies that need to exist so that you can unlock companies like Redwire and True Anomaly and Apex and the access to private capital and public markets that we that we have to accelerate uh, those systems. I agree, Thank if you. I can. I agree 100% with what Evan said. And if you look, uh, I think on some of the acquisitions, we're very risk adverse still. If we're really gonna outpace the adversaries, we've gotta go to a managed risk. Yeah. And if you're wanting us to move fast, we should actually make sure that we're changing kind of the way and the mentality on how we're acquiring systems, right? You can't stay in this risk adverse mode all, all, all totality. Uh, if you want to move fast, we got to move fast on the uh, contract side as well. So I'll, I'll turn this into a question for the audience. Raise your hand if you've ever been part of a satellite on orbit, one way or another. <laughs> There's no way that only three of you in the audience have <laughs> only, we're, we're at a satellite conference. Come on, guys. Put your uh, hand down. Yeah if every satellite launch you've been a part of has been on time. All right. All right, well, somehow there's a lot of hands down, but from <laughs> my gathering of data from as many people as I've talked to, almost nothing ever happens on time. And what this gets to, it gets to the points that everybody before me just made, our existing supply base, our defense industrial base is not at the level of our near-peer adversaries. When we hear China or Russia announcing plans to launch constellations of tens of thousands of satellites, and our ability to produce is orders of magnitude below that, something has to change. And when we think about that threat, it really comes down to if we want class A systems and long contracting processes, similar to what Dean was just saying, we're not gonna solve that. We have to think about where can we fit on the risk curve? How can we accelerate our own industrial base, build things more quickly, and really solve for that core risk of our supply base just not being able to keep up with both internal demand, but then external near peer adversaries. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and for what it's worth, um, uh, Andy mentioned uh, NASIC a little while ago. Uh, at NSSA, uh, NASIC, NSIC today uh, comes into the city in DC and, and uh, brings what they call their circuit briefs which is what, what's really happening in, in, in the threats world coming out of China and Russia on a monthly basis. Uh, they, um, they, they bring those briefings to the senior executives across the administration over on Capitol Hill, and they've been very uh, generous in allowing us to find a place uh, in the DC area in a skiff to where they can share their, their same presentation to our industry members. So keep that in mind. Uh, Matt McNitt, if you're not on our address list for that, Throw your business card at, at uh, Matt, and he'll uh, make sure you guys get introduced to those things. Uh, another softball kind of related technology. Uh, we'll go back around the other way around. Okay, your turn, bud. Uh, what, in your mind, what cutting edge technology do you see that's essential for increasing resiliency? 
So, in my opinion, it's not about going back to the drawing board and trying to reinvent something crazy new and crazy different because that adds a lot of risk. It comes down to looking at what have we already done that works and how do we optimize that system? And a lot of it comes back to what Evan was saying earlier actually about that full stack integration and how do you make sure all of the systems that you really put together are able to talk to each other, are cohesive, are potentially all built by the same company. And that I would argue is almost more of an innovation of in and of itself than trying to go to the drawing board and saying, okay, let's try to invent some crazy new technology. Yeah, I, 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 I Ian said it really well. I actually think the breakthrough is coming. This is not a sh I'm not a shill for SpaceX, but I'm, this is the breakthrough is going to be Starship because it creates a new floor for innovation for the pace of pace of innovation. And so I think like it's hard for us to stand up here and point to a single technology because really the breakthroughs happen at the intersection of a variety of technologies that I think low cost launch will enable at a scale and at an inflection point that that you know we'll be there to innovate on but it's but it's hard to say until you kind of have that capacity at your disposal right there's some really interesting companies actually that are exploring what it means to go the other direction right which is rather than small and low cost how do you get to really really big and low cost k2 space is a great example of that um so it'll be interesting to see the kind of new reconfigurations and smashing together of existing technologies and processes they're very mature they're very much we know as 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 a country, we know how to build very, very complex capabilities. And so really what we're talking about is the refactoring of capabilities that already exist, but in new and interesting ways, vis-a-vis -vis this new innovation floor set by Starship. Resiliency in numbers in some respects, yes. And speed. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. Dean. Yes, yeah, so Steve, I think if you look at resilience and you define resilience, uh, one kind of mission assurance attribute you see uh, the Space Force using and really Space de uh, Development Agency is proliferation. And I think kind of two areas that you'll see in the proliferation on the technology side are really critical. First, commodity buses, right? If you go back, I think commodity buses are probably uh, in the last uh, 15 years, one of the most needed technologies we've needed, the ability to actually have a commodity bus. And thanks to the leadership of Evan and Ian, right? There are two companies, commercial companies, both CEOs leading that to have commodity buses. Another, I think, is when you start looking at proliferated antennas and the ability to have communications and actually the ability to have low cost, affordable, proliferatable antennas to do warfighter communications to the ground. But I actually think um, a second attribute is orbit diversity. And so one of the things I'm really proud of at Redwire, and you probably saw this earlier, but we introduced uh, uh, a VLEO capability called Sabersat, and I believe that's gonna add orbit diversity and complement the work that both Ian and Evan are doing, and it's gonna add the ability to have this hybrid architecture that Andy talked about, to be able to bring a variety of capacity in different orbits, and, uh, and really to bring the, really the data to the warfighters on the ground, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and guardians on the ground. So as a science and technology guy, I'm going to start with the really Gucci answer first, and then I'm going to give you the real non-Gucci answer that I think is even more important, right? So as we look forward to what resilient architectures need to be, it's going to be about the data. We don't necessarily need more hardware on orbit per se. We don't necessarily need more sensors. Sometimes we just need better tools to go after the data. So that's Gucci things like data fusion, machine learning, machine intelligence, human-machine uh, in, uh, interactions and implementations for decision-making. I think there's a whole trade space of really cool technologies that we're going to need in order to enhance the capability of the operator, because we're not going to have enough humans. We already know that within Space Force. So we're going to need data tools. We're going to need machine and human teaming to go after that in order to make decisions as fast as we need to for where the future of information-dominated warfare is going to go. So that, of course, is the, the lab guy's Gucci answer. But the non-Gucci answer is for any of that to work, we need open systems and open, and open architectures. We need things to be able to talk to other things. We get resiliency when we're not just dependent on SpaceX and Starlink, but we can go to any communication system that's available to us, whether it's OneWeb, whether it's SES, whether it's a Leo constellation, a Geo constellation, a Mio constellation, whether it's government owned uh, with the transport layer from uh, Space Development Agency, commercial, international partners, 
All of that is what we need to go after to, to achieve true resiliency. And that occurs when we have the appropriate level of open, open architectures where we can communicate back and forth between those architectures. And so the problem and the struggle that we have right now on the government side is where in the tech stack should the government own and enforce those open architectures? And where do we allow industry to black box it so that they can retain their critical proprietary, their, their information that they want to protect? And that's the challenge right now. And we got to figure out what that right balance is because we don't want the government to create a whole bunch of standards like we did with mil spec in, in the 80s and 90s, right? But what we need to understand is how do we create those open architectures, those open interfaces so that we can open up that trade space for any good idea. It allows us to move away from waterfall approaches like what Jolly mentioned and allow us to operate much more agilely in a, in a much more agile mindset so that we can be dynamic and we can move just as fast or faster than our adversaries. If, if I may, Steve, one of the ways the industry is able to not only engage with the government with themselves is really in the National Security Space Association. And uh, for those of you in the audience, I'm sure many of you are members. If you're not, it's really an incredible forum for this communication. You're talking about understanding the requirements, understanding what's needed for us to start building solutions that, that really help the adversary advance uh, really the, the threat and the threat we're seeing. Thanks. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Two, two claps there, right? <laughs> Um, picking up on this whole conversation, let's talk amongst us friends here. Um, to your to your points, uh, Andy, you're trying to find the right solutions and whatnot. How do we all on the table here at, uh, and chairs here uh, assess the interaction that takes place between our companies and customers like Andy in trying to find some of those right right approaches looking forward? Is it an open discussion? Uh, is 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 the government listening? Is the dynamic discussions happening? Trying to collectively find the right solutions. How do we assess that? Yeah, we'll, I, we'll go first. yeah, Please, I'll, go I'll, I'll jump in. I, I actually think that the our, our conversations with the DoD have been, I, I think, very productive and very open. Um, I think the DoD is looking for fast but bold ideas right now, and they're actually not afraid of scale. They're just trying to figure out how to scale in um, to large opportunities. Uh, and they know they have a significant problem. The senior leaders are talking about Absolutely. it all the time. And they know that it's at the intersection of both hardware and software. And they're hungry for solutions. They're hungry for change. And they're trying to align the acquisition methods to do that. I think ultimately what slows um, the interaction down uh, is really what I was articulating earlier, which is there's uncertainty about necessarily what to build. So we're stuck between this requirements pull and this capabilities push. And the requirements pull is, you know, we, it's very easy to get comfortable behind what's written in requirements documents and put on slide decks by analytical organizations, but there's still some discomfort around whether we're really expending our resources properly. So I think that what's been effective for us in, in interacting with the DOD is showing a path to the bold solution, the bold comprehensive solution, but a way to scale in, in a way that balances risk between industry and the DOD. Thank you. Ian, would you like to go? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer to this. I think different groups within DOD and the government think about things in different ways. One uh, example to highlight is probably Space Development Agency, and I would argue they've been one of the more, if not the most, forward-leaning organizations, where they go out and they very, very clearly say, here's my roadmap, here's what we were trying to do, and then they say, we don't want just the traditional you know, usual suspects, we want a mix of that and the newer non-traditionals as well. And being able to do that in an unclassified environment where you could explain what you want in that architecture and invite people to come into it is an amazing asset. Now, not all groups within the government think in that same way, but there's a spectrum and seeing that move in that direction, I think has been very encouraging for younger companies like ourselves. Absolutely. I would say, you know, a lot of times when you look at the requirements, uh, when you start looking in the Pentagon and ODNI and you start looking at the collaboration at the highest level, I think the collaboration is the best uh, that I've seen in my career uh, where ODNI and you mentioned the NASIC Intel analysts and how they're really driving and sharing. 
And you heard uh, probably John Plum talking about how they're working and they're modifying policies and trying to get more data out at a lower classification level. That uh, initiative led by OSD policy is going to be critical and helping the service, the Space Force. And that's really informing. And uh, I agree with you 100%, Ian, with Space Development Agency, how we've seen the work they've done. I think uh, uh, Dr. Scalise and, uh, and Dr. Mink and what they've done at the end of row has done a great. I want to look at uh, what you're seeing out of AFRL. They are uh, doing an amazing job. I think engaging with the needs they have and, in, uh, and really being very transparent on the needs they have and how they're actually, uh, their plan is to actually be roadmaps to support the Space Force. So whether you're sitting in LA at SSC or you're in another place in the Space Force, they're really working together. It, it appears to me as the most integrated joint roadmaps, which didn't exist maybe a decade ago. Good point. Andy, you, you're getting it from both both angles here. So your thoughts, sir? Yeah, I mean, it, to me, it all comes down to trying to achieve maximum extent of open and transparent communication. Every successful project that I've been on has been enabled by open and transparent communication between the government and a team of contractors, not just government and the prime contractor. It's the contractors that are willing to share their information across each other because they know that protecting your IP is, is always challenging, right? There's a, b a bunch of smart people out there. They want to move fast. I've worked with a lot of startups over my career at AFRL, thousands of cyber companies, thousands of cyber proposals. And I can almost tell you explicitly from day one, from the phase one proposal, who's going to be a successful company and who's not. And it comes down to one specific thing. The company that wants me to sign an NDA before they'll even talk to me as a government guy almost always fail because they are so protective there of their IP that they become transfixed on that piece. The ones that are open and want to share, they know that they have to move fast and they enable the processes to move fast to do that. And so those are the ones that are the most successful because they're constantly moving fast. So there's a few, few lessons there. One is the government has to learn how to operate like that because we have typically been the antithesis of that, right? We, we are very slow. We're very methodical. We, we protect from a security standpoint. We generally don't have those open communications. Sometimes it's risk of fear of protest, whatever. But we have to move and we're trying to move to be more open and transparent. So lever leveraging things like OTAs, and that transaction authority allows us to have those discussions before a contract is even let are ways that we start to communicate. But we need to make sure that we also have that open communication reciprocated from industry. When we send out a request for a proposal, give us what the real cost is. This is something that Mr. Calvelli has foot stomped a couple of times, right? We are successful when we know what that real cost is and you're not necessarily trying to, trying to game the system to win that award just to see that award blow up in a cost perspective later. But we also need to know what requirements that we are providing to you are causing you to, your cost to explode. Because we may think that we're asking for something very easy that is something very hard, and we may not actually care about that requirement all that much. So come back and push and say, you know, we know you wanted to achieve X, but if you just allow us a little bit of flexibility there, it opens a lot more tr design trade space. And those are the types of transparent discussions that we need to start having if we are going to move fast and we're going to keep pace with our adversaries. Well said. Well, when, uh, when Andy mentioned that, uh, that IP story, I saw a couple of head nods. I saw a few flinches. <laughs> <laughs> we may want to hit the rewind button on that a little bit and uh, think about that. Uh, it's an important factor that everybody ch uh, truly of respects, and it's a difficult challenge from time to time as a practical matter. Uh, okay, folks, uh, I'm going to ask one more question, and after that, we're going to hand the microphone over to you guys so and gals. So anyone who has something in mind, uh, let us know. Uh, Omar, is there a separate microphone? Is there going to be a separate microphone for that? Or we can, okay, there we go, there we go. Okay, so this last one I'll throw at you, gentlemen, uh, comes from a guy named John Shaw. Heard of him. Uh, he mentioned, he says, you know, maybe a thought for you to consider asking, Steve, is uh, his view is uh, one reason we lack resiliency today is that we, the United States, continue to do what General Shaw calls positional space operations 
where our capabilities largely stay in very predictable orbits that make them very easy to target. I think we all understand that aspect of things, right? Um, so positional space ops to him is also, he thinks, largely why we have what we call first mover advantage in space right now, uh, which is destabilizing, incentivizes an adversary to strike first. Think about that for a moment, right? So DSO could introduce significant uncertainty and possibly even lead to second mover advantage if the first mover, quote, misfires. So with that said, um, A, how could sustained maneuver and dynamic space operations change this equation? And B, whatever else do you have to say about that? Dean, I'm going to let you go first because you're the guy who was thinking about that yeah. long and hard. Steve, thanks. This is a great question. And by the way, uh, I do want to uh, answer this initially by saying uh, I had a chance this weekend to be with the uh, Space Generation uh, Fusion Forum. And really a shout out to the Space uh, Generation um, uh, Council for putting that together. Uh, and we got to see the next generation looking at this problem and tackling this problem. And it was just really, uh, really delightful to have a chance to, to be with so many young professionals in industry. And uh, I'm excited to see where they're going to bring it. But I actually go on to John Shaw's question, uh, Steve. So actually at Air War College in 2014, actually my thesis paper was uh, why a kindergarten game of tic-tac-toe should inform space protection and resiliency. And it's like how you move on the tic-tac-toe board actually determines if you win or if you're a stalemate or you lose. And I agree with uh, General Shaw 100%. That first mover advantage is really critical. And it's really going to require uh, a lot of the really key aspects we've talked about today is you've got to understand if something is a threat. So you've got to have that space domain awareness. And then you've got to have the ability uh, and really capacity with your bus to do those maneuvers. So it really is a, when I look at industry, uh, you know, we are building to the, through the requirements that we're getting from government, also partnerships with companies like Velos and others out there that are, that are really supporting and providing information and really helping us understand the requirements. It really allows us to then build uh, resilient capabilities. Who would like to jump on top of that one? Andy? Yeah, I'll go. go um, this is a this is a topic at AFRL we've been thinking a lot about. Uh, I want to say maybe we were thinking about it before a Space Command was, um, but I'm not sure because it was around the same kind of time frame. Uh, but it was a it was a thought that we were looking at for when we were going to do our next major flight experiment, and it was really looking at what is the role of space logistics in the future fight. Because we know that logistics is a key attribute of every other warfighting domain, right? It's the age-old quote of amateurs talk tactics and professionals talk logistics. So the question that we posed within, within AFRL was, what does space logistics look like in the future? Because we saw things like SpaceX coming with lower cost launch. We saw uh, the, the kind of starting the growth of, uh, of ideas of refueling and things like that. So we had some conversations internally uh, we talked to Dr. Joel Mosier. I'll sh throw the shout out to him because he coined the phrase that we started using, which was maneuver without regret. Absolutely. Which was really the kind of the precursor, what we think to the dynamic space operations. And it was really looking at how do we achieve that exact dynamic piece? Because we think of space being a dynamic environment, but it's really static because everything is flying on Kepler rails, right? We generally know where everything is going to be at any given time. And so the question was, one, how do we move away from that and create uh, uncertainty? And two, how do we get to the point where we are flying satellites based on what the mission requirements are and not worried about, well, I used 10 kilometer or 10 meters per second of Delta V. I just took, you know, six months off the lifetime of my satellite and I require three signatures, three levels of signatures to do that, right? How do we get to dynamic space operations? And refueling was part of it, but very quickly within AFRL, we're like, Okay, that's one piece, but what we really need to get to is a more dynamic environment than that. How do we do uh, modular propulsion? How do we do not just refueling, but propulsion module swap out so that, that we're not subservient to a hydrazine fuel economy for the next 20 years? And if we can swap out a propulsion module, we can swap out sensors and other things. So that starts to create additional capability, additional dynamic operations. And so there's a key maneuver piece, there's a key upgrade piece that will create complexity, 
But there's another key piece with dynamic space operations that we need to think through as well. And that is, it's not just about maneuver. It's about dynamic operations from information. It goes back to moving in and out of different comm frequencies and paths. It's about dynamic spectrum allocation on orbit. How do we create true dynamic operations? I think the first step is, is for the maneuver piece, but I think it's a digital dynamics as well that we need to consider and include. A great I, input for the two of you folks here to the extent that it applies to you all. Yeah, it absolutely how do you, does. How do you as, talk? As, I, as I said, when I opened the conversation, our portion of the conversation, we're, we're really designing from a theory of victory at True Anomaly. So we're not starting with a technology, we're starting with a theory of conflict. And for us, that theory of conflict is, is an instantiation of mosaic warfare, or excuse me, maneuver warfare, warfare called mosaic warfare. And it demands really two things. One is elastic cohesion, and the second is the capacity to execute fast transients. And so what we mean by dynamic space operations and this sort of counter theory of where we find ourselves today is the inability to rapidly change our state. And where most folks really narrow in is on, oh, well, that really just means like position and velocity. And really it's, position, it's the kinematic degrees of freedom, but it's also degrees of freedom in information. It's spectrum, it's phenomenology, it's, uh, and it's the fusion and the intersection of all of those. And if you get that right, then you have the ability to go execute this concept called elastic cohesion, which is actually a naval surface warfare concept from uh, the 1950s. Um, and it's the idea that it really is the foundation of the way that Navy thinks about a combined arms approach to warfare, and it applies beautifully in the space domain. It's the capacity to bring effects from dispersed geographical and temporal areas to a objective at the time and place of your choosing, not driven by the adversary's motion. Um, so maneuverability is part of that, right? The kinematic envelope of your systems, the kinematic coverage of your systems. But it's much broader than that, which is you have to have decision making right, which means that you have to have the right inbound information and you have to pump it through. You have to fuse that information and pump it through the right type of sense making algorithms that go way beyond space domain awareness. It's not just can I get an IR signature on top of visible visible light signature on top of an RF signature? It's really what does that mean about the future potential states of my adversary? And then what does that mean about my ability to front run that? Um, so John Shaw and I have actually argued about this in a very productive way. I think we're going to try to work on something together uh, as well. But the the words we'll leave you with from, from our perspective and how we design Jackal and Mosaic and future capabilities is fast transients, which is a concept from John Boyd and elastic cohesion, which is a naval surface warfare concept. Yeah, more yeah, to follow on, there. Yeah, Ian, go ahead. So we believe the idea of dynamic space operations really starts at the spacecraft, the satellite bus level. And if you try to design a satellite bus that's capable of a tremendous amount of delta V and crazy maneuverability, you start to forget what the original mission was and what the goal of that payload was. So our philosophy is on the bus level, if you're able to build the system that's configurable, where you could say, oh, in this satellite bus, I want more Delta V, or in this one, I need a six degree of freedom system, or in this one, you know, I need whatever it may be. That allows the end user and the end customer uh, to very rapidly decide on different capabilities for different payloads, as opposed to everything trying to encompass, you know, the, uh, the world's best of absolutely every capability. So we think of it a little bit differently, but at the end of the day, Right, we end up using our platforms for the payload companies and the primes who are looking to put it into orbit and are really thinking firsthand about what those dynamic operations look like. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, can you all hear me? Uh, questions from the audience. We've got a few minutes here. Any, any questions on, from the audience? Shy. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Any questions from the audience? Be sure to ask Dean really hard ones. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. I, I see some ambiguously friendly faces in the office, <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the audience. Going once, going twice. I, any questions, anyone? Oh, they're going to let us off easy. I think you guys did such oh, I think they let us off. I smashed think you it. guys did such a good job that no one. I guess so, but I know. <laughs> I'll just yell, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank our Steve panel here. I want to thank Redwire for together, Dean, you've got a great team, Omar, you're a wonderful guy, the team, but 
thank everybody for being here and taking us all in. Very important topic. Uh, hopefully uh, you got something out of it. I certainly did myself. So uh, let's all have a good time. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Steve, I agree. Right. Thanks go, to gang. Ian, to Jolly, and to Andy. Thank you so much.